to the chapter one lecture video, Accounting and Business. During this chapter, we're going to learn these conceptual, analytical, and procedural objectives. Learning objective number one, explain the purpose and importance of accounting. So as we're doing the importance of accounting, main idea is we're going to be identifying transactions and events that need to be recorded. We're going to be recording them and then we're going to communicate what we've recorded so people can know what happened in our business. That's the importance of accounting. So people know what happens in the business. A lot of times we call these people stakeholders. Sometimes they have a specific reason for wanting to know what's going on in our business. They want to invest in us. They're managing the business. They're uh, wanting to maybe work for the business, something like that. Learning objective number two, identify users and uses of and opportunities in accounting. <clears throat> so this first uh, course you're gonna be taking, BA 211, uh, intro to financial accounting, right? This is, uh, these are some users of financial information, okay? So we're gonna talk about Mainly the financial accounting is going to focus on the external users. Internal users, it's going to be mostly for uh, the next section or the, the managerial accounting stuff that we're going to be covering in BA 213. And that's really where the internal users come into play. So anyways, the accounting is the language of business. So inter external users are going to be people like lenders, banks, those type of things, external auditors, shareholders, who own shares of the company, board of directors, regulators, and cons customers. Internal users that are gonna be using f financial information are gonna be uh, those managers that are involved in marketing, production, distribution, purchasing, research, and development. So people that are managing the company. Lots of opportunities in accounting. You know, this is, this is one thing, me personally, I got my undergrad actually in kind of a more general business discipline, international business with a minor in Japanese. And then I decided later on in my career that I wanted more tangible, applicable skills. And that's when I went back and got my CPA. And so uh, there's a lot of opportunities in accounting when you know the application of accounting and, and the language of business. So the, the, this is all of them, I'm not gonna read them out, but there's definitely a lot of opportunities in accounting. Learning objective number three, explain why ethics are crucial to accounting. The main reason why ethics are crucial to accounting is your financial information needs to be trusted, right? You need to be able to trust and know that the information is good. So in this case, we're going to be using something called the fraud triangle to understand how fraud can happen within an organization. So basically the three sides of the fraud triangle are opportunity, which means that somebody can see a way of committing fraud, a rationalization, which means that somehow they're going to say it's okay to do it or I'm justified, and then financial pressure, which leads a lot of times to um, a rationalization as well, but they're, they have a pr pressure to commit fraud. So a lot of a lot of employees that have that are in situations where they can commit fraud are actually bonded by organizations, and so which basically means the organization goes to a bonding agency and says, "I want to insure myself, uh, buy some insurance, an insurance policy for this person who can basically uh, hurt me financially because I'm giving them uh, control over my finances." or assets or whatever this uh the more financial pressure you have on yourself as an individual the more uh debt you're in um if you're uh, actually late and defaulting on debt or bankrupt then that's that includes financial pressure and it's more expensive to bond somebody who has this financial pressure so just just a fyi there so there is actually law that's been um created around ethics, right? The ethics of accounting, Sarbanes-Oxley or SOX is one of those things and that was done back in the day. Dodd-Frank's another one, 
to help uh, ensure that financial professionals are not uh, hurting consumers. And so, so anyways, um, a learning objective uh, C4, explain generally accepted accounting principles and define and apply several accounting principles. Okay, so the uh, generally accepted accounting principles are also known as GAAP, so G-A-A-P. These are the bedrock or the foundation of accounting, professional accounting, okay, uh, in the U.S. Um, there's also an international set of uh, principles are used as well. So uh, generally accepted accounting principles. Make sure that the information is relevant in that, and, and that it's timely, right? And the information is the information that users can use. Reliable, right? So uh, ethics and, and uh, the reliability of the information is, is uh, put into GAP. And also comparable, meaning that all companies use the same principles to prepare their financial statements. So if you want to compare company A to comp company B, you know that they are doing their accounting with the same GAAP principles. So you should be able to compare them. There are, like I said, there, there are um, international standards. There's an International Accounting Standards Board and they've created something called uh, IFRS, um, which is the uh, international equivalent of the US GAAP, right? And and slowly but surely this gap the gap US GAAP and the IFRS are are becoming more and more similar because a lot of US companies are international of course and and we live in a pretty global world as it is. Okay, so this is the conceptual framework behind gap. Bedrock foundation is recognition and measurement. We're going to talk about the principles that are related to those. Then on top of that, we're going to talk about qualitative characteristics and elements. Elements are uh, they're the defining items that financial statements can contain. So we're going to talk about the financial statements, right, and the elements that we're measuring. Um, and then at the very top, we have objectives of financial accounting, right? This is where we want it to be reliable. We want people to be able to use it, right? Investors, creditors, others. All right, so to get on to principles and assumptions, okay? This is the principles, assumptions, and constraints. The general principles are assumptions and concepts and guidelines for preparing financial statements. The uh, specific principles are detailed rules, right? So there's specific rules that we're going to talk about. And so this is kind of the, the little building of gap here. We've got cost benefit on the bottom. Um, going across are the assumptions. Uh, the main pillars are the principles that hold up the building. Okay, so here are the main principles. Okay, in pink we have the measurement principle, which is also called the cost principle. This is when we base uh, counting on actual costs, uh, and uh, we'll talk about that as well. But but this basically, um, and so also measurement principle means that we're um, being able to uh, base everything on the same currency. So currency kind of gets involved in the measurement principle as well. Up here in tan brown, revenue recognition principle. We reven rec recognize revenues. Revenues is when you earn money, right? Okay, so um, number one, we recognize revenues when goods or services are provided to the customer. So we have to, when, if we recognize revenues, we actually have to do the service or we have to hand over the goods to them, right? So we're gonna provide them or we're gonna hand it over to them. And the number two, uh, Point of the revenue recognition principle, we need to make ha we need to have an amount that is expected to be received from the customer. Revenue recognition. This is important to know. We don't necessarily need to receive cash or payment at the same time we earn revenue. They can be at different times. So that's accrual basis accounting. We'll get into this deeper, and that's why number two is important. At an amount expected to be received from the customer. Down here in blue on the left is the expense recognition principle. It's often called the matching principle because we're, ex 
we're matching up expenses. Expenses are um, co the cost, right? The expenses of doing business, right? And so when we when we um, we record expenses as they incur uh, to rev to generate revenue, right? So we know we understand how when we're going to record revenue when we earn it, right? When we when we pass the goods off or when we provide services and when there's an amount expected to be received in return, we record expenses in tandem with this, right? As we do things to record or to uh, earn revenue, we can record the expenses that we're incurring as we're doing those business activities. So we'll, talk, we'll do some examples uh, later in the uh, exercise uh, video. And then uh, purple here, full disclosure principle, meaning that a company reports details behind the financial statement. So all the numbers on the page, if there's important information that we need to know to make sure we understand the full picture, not just the numbers, but the full picture, that needs to be disclosed. For example, if there is a lawsuit pending, right? Or perhaps um, if there is some uh, other legislation or something else behind the scenes that's going to impact the company, we need to bring that to the forefront or disclose it. Accounting assumptions. The going concern assumption is basically just saying we assume that this company that we're doing accounting records for is going to continue on into forever right if it's not and we know the end is either near or the end is in sight we need to disclose that um, so that's in green there the purple letters here monetary unit assumption that gets back to our costing principle and transactions and events are expressed in monetary or money units okay we don't do accounting in eggs or the uh, pounds of bacon we do it in, in actual monetary money units whether it's dollar bills or pounds or pesos or yuan, whatever your, the currency is, right? So um, down in yellow here in blue, business entity assumption, we're assuming that our accounting records are done for a specific defined business entity. Uh, if it's a sole proprietorship and it's owned by one person, then that's the then that's the entity we're doing it for. If it's a partnership and many people have ownership in it, that's the entity. If it's a big corporation with lots of different uh, departments or uh, different uh, subsidies and all these things, that's the entity, right? So we need to define that to be able to move forward. We need to assume we know that. And then the last one here in blue, down on the right is time period assumption. We assume that our accounting is being done for a certain defined period of time. Uh, typically that's a year. A calendar year could start in January and in December. It could be a fiscal year where it starts in uh, July and ends in June, for example. Depends on how it goes. The assumption is we do have a period that we're tracking accounting records for. Um, these are different kinds of entities that we do accounting for. We'll get into that more later on. Um, you probably have covered them if you've done business classes before. Um, these are two constraints, right? Cost-benefit constraint, meaning this is something that uh, we need to be aware of, right? That might constrain accounting and reporting activities. Cost-benefit means that we, we need to be able to look at um, the work to do the accounting and reporting and say, is the cost of doing this accounting and tracking and reporting equal to the benefit received? Uh, one example might be that you might not want to invest all the time and energy into tracking every single staple that is used within your business and the expense related to staples. Uh, there might not be a, a, benef a big enough benefit for the cost that it would take to do that. Um, so maybe there is. Maybe staples are super important to your company and a big item on your financial uh, statement. That leads us down to materiality. So materiality is based on uh, size, right? Is it material? Is it a big enough uh, item to for us to uh, worry about, right? Auditors do this all the time. They base things on materiality. 
uh, depending on the size of the organization. So for example, with financial records, they might have a number in mind, say anything that's bigger than a $1,000 uh, error or whatever, we're going to uh, count that as material or something that we need to worry about. A larger company, it might be more like 10,000 or 20,000. Materiality, it doesn't go into play if something is fraudulent, right? Maybe the materiality is just related to mistakes or, or systems that uh, may not be working correctly, whatever the case is. If it's fraudulent, uh, a $1 is important and we need to look into that. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and continue with learning objective A1, which is define and interpret the accounting equation and each of its components. So let's go ahead and look at the accounting equation. Here it is in all of its glory. The accounting equation it, it, it consists of three parts. The first part is assets. Assets is on the far left. So the assets of a corporation are things that the corporation has claim to. Okay, Doesn't necessarily mean that the corporation or the business entity, as it may be, has paid for those assets, right? So it just has claim to be able to use them. And, and there's also an, another in, interesting component for assets. They have future, possible future benefits, right, that are attached to them. So for example, you own a truck for the business, you have claim on it, even if the bank even if you had to take out a loan to buy the truck, it's in your assets uh, and it's going to benefit you in the future by allowing you to make deliveries, right, and earn revenue. Okay, so assets equals liabilities. Liabilities uh, are just what they sound like, right? Like loans from the bank, things that you are liable to do things you owe other people, okay? So that's liability. It could be you owe them cash. It could be that you owe them services, right? You haven't earned the uh, revenue that you've received, for example, uh, cash you've received, plus equity. So assets equals liabilities plus equity. Equity is the ownership of the company, right? So liabilities, okay, so it, we may be able to draw it out like this, where assets, here we go, we may be, able to, may be able to draw it out like this, where our assets, right here, let's say this is uh, a building that we own, right? So here's our building, there it is, there's the smokestack and the smoke coming out of our building, okay? So Mr. Bell has serious uh, art skills, so there we go. So there's our building. We own this building, right? We use it for our business. Uh, the bank, right? So here's the bank. We took out a mortgage for this building, right? To buy the building. We had some of the money ourselves. We put up some of our own money and we used the mortgage from the bank, right? So here is our, here is the owner owner or owners, depending on the business entity structure. Uh, so the bank has claim on this asset right here, this building, right? For the amount of the mortgage. Equity is our claim on the, on the building as well, or any of the assets that are in there, right? So really, these over here on this side could be considered claim, claims on assets so for example if we were to go bankrupt for example and we liquidated our company we sold all of our assets how much of it would we have to give to our the liability part right to the banks and the other creditors and how much of it could we keep ourselves? that's the equity right side of it okay so that's just basic basic equity the expanded accounting equation is down below, which is assets equals liability plus equity, which now is larger, right? It includes, 
it includes owner's capital. This is our main equity account. Permanent. This is something we call a permanent account, right? Okay, so this is permanent. Permanent account. The other three, owner withdrawals. Owner withdrawals. Owner withdrawals, this is when the ownership takes assets out of the company. Cash or whatever assets, it's, they're withdrawing them out of the company. As you can imagine, that reduces equity, right? And then we have this little section here, which is revenues. We Remember, we have accounting and principles related to this. When we can recognize revenues is when we earn it, right? These are... This is what we earn. And then the related, and that, you, as you can imagine, revenues, as we earn revenues, that also increases equity, right? Increases our ownership. Minus expenses. These two together, revenues and expenses together, are net income, right? Revenue minus expense equals net income. If expenses are larger than revenues, then it's a net loss, but anyways. So expenses are matched up with revenues and recorded for accrual basis accounting. Expenses are things like utility expense, uh, cost of goods sold, right? When If we buy something to resell, the, the cost of whatever we bought to resell is gonna be an expense. Um, it could be things like salaries, right? We're paying our employees and those type of things. Money we give ownership is not an expense. That is owner withdrawals. So owner withdrawals and expenses are both reducing equity overall. Okay? So that's the accounting equation. Assets equals liabilities plus equity. Equity expanded is owner's capital minus owner withdrawals plus revenues minus expenses. So that's the, that's the full equation. The Im most important part of this, this right here, the equal sign, this has to stay balanced, right? We've got to balance this equation. That's, that's the most important uh, idea of the accounting equation is for it to stay balanced, okay? So that's, that makes it a tool for us to use as we go forward and look at our different transactions in our company like we'll see next. Okay, well, this is our next learning objective. P1, analyze business transactions using the accounting equation. Okay, so this is transaction number one, investment by owner. So the owner has something that they want to put into the company. In this case, it is cash. Cash is is it an asset, a liability, or equity? It's an asset, right? It's tangible things that we have claim on, right? So cash is our number one asset. So the this uh, Taylor is investing or giving cash to the business. To, to uh, remember the uh, business entity uh, assumption, right? The idea is we have Chas Taylor up here which is one entity. Their personal records are not the business records, right? So Chas up here has this cash in their personal bank account, not the business bank account. And over here we have fast forward, no cash, no nothing. We just started the company and now we're taking this cash right here, Chas is, Taylor, and he's putting it into the company. Now we have the cash in the company. The cash is no longer a personal asset of Chas Taylor. It is an asset of the entity, the business entity that we're doing business records for, okay? So I just wanted to draw that out. Accounts involved are cash, an asset. Two, C. Taylor Capital, which is equity, right? That's our main equity account. So that's the C. Taylor gives the cash to the company, but they're giving it, right? So they want something in return. What they get in return is ownership of the company in the amount 
of the cash. Okay. So as we break it out into the accounting equation, we're going to have our cash going into the assets on the left. $30,000. Assets equals liabilities plus equity. So on the other side of the equal sign, we need $30,000, right? So we're going to put that in capital. Boom, we still balance. That's the accounting equation right there. Okay, transaction number two, we're going to purchase cash, uh, supplies for cash. So we need some supplies to run our business. The company purchases supplies paying $2,500 in cash. Accounts involved are cash. Cash is going out, right? Where it's redu being reduced. It's an asset. Supplies are being increased. It's an asset. We're swapping assets basically on this one, right? And so as we bring it to the accounting equation, it's going to look like this. Here come, it's all on the same side of the equation. So we can still have a balance if we take cash out and then put our, right? So cash goes out and we put our supplies in the same side of the equation and voila, it still balances, right? So that's, the, that's kind of what this is showing us. So we're swapping assets. When we buy supplies, we may think, oh, that's an expense, but it's not. We only expense supplies when we use them. When we buy them, they're an asset sitting in our supply room, right? So we haven't used them yet. We haven't matched them, the matching principle, match them up to revenue, right? So as we use supplies and generate revenue, then we can expense them. We'll do that later. Now we're going to purchase equipment for cash. That's transaction number three. Equipment is going to cost us $26,000 cash. Here are the accounts involved. Cash is involved, right? Is it going up or down? Cash is going down, right? We're, we're paying out cash for the equipment. Equipment is an asset as well, right? It's going up, right? So we're getting equipment into our company. That's an asset that's increasing. Now let's look at the accounting equation. Number three here. $26,000 $26, in cash reduced, that's a negative right there. So these little brackets, just like our supplies right here, the brackets are going to be uh, brackets right here, basically denoting that this is a negative number, right? That's kind of the accounting negative number sign here when we put it in brackets. We don't use minus signs necessarily. So this is going down, cash is going down, and equipment is going up, therefore we stay in balance, right? So that's the important part of keeping the accounting equation in balance. Transaction number four, purchase supplies on credit. So on credit means not with cash, right? So on credit, we are doing this uh, on account, right? So we're going to our supplier and we're saying, hey, can we buy some supplies? We can't, we'll pay for them later. We're good for it. And they do the whole uh, credit check and all this stuff for us. And they say, you know what? We'll go ahead. We'll give you the supplies. You pay us later. So is cash involved in this one? No, cash is not. But supplies are. We're getting more supplies. So the supplies are going up. Accounts payable is in this one. This is our liability, right? This is us owing our supplier or our vendor is another name for a supplier. We're owing the vendor some money. We have to pay him later, right? And so the liability is going up. So let's see how this looks in our accounting equation. So we're going to be on the opposite sides of the equal sign here, right? Our supplies are going up which increases our total balance in this case, right? We had 2,500, now we're adding 7,100. We got 9,600 here. Accounts payable, we had zero in there to begin with. Now we have 7,100, boom, there's our balance. Overall, again, 
important thing, accounting equation remains in balance, right? So now we're gonna look at some transactions involving revenues and expenses and withdrawals. Those are the three other accounts in the equity side that we haven't uh, dealt with yet, right? We, we put some money or we put some, uh, we dealt with the capital account when the owner invested in the company, but we haven't dealt with the other three in equity yet. So here we go. So now our company provides services. We go and we say, hey, let's uh, do some business here. So we, we got a customer, they said, do this for us, and we did it. So we did it for cash. So what are the accounts involved? We got paid cash, right? Asset went up, right? Our assets went up. Revenues, right? So why are we recording or recognizing revenues here? We recognize revenue when the revenue is earned. Did we do the work? Did we earn it? Yes, we provided services for, for that. Whether it's cash or on credit, doesn't matter. We earned the revenue because we did the work. Let's look and see how it looks in the accounting equation. Here's our cash we received on the left side and on the right side, there's our revenue. Increasing equity, right? Increasing both sides. Asset side and liability and equity side, specifically in the equity, is our revenue increase. Okay, so we're still balancing here. And now we're moving on to transaction six and seven. So we're gonna pay uh, for our expenses in cash. Okay, so here's we're paying for rent and salaries. Accounts involved, we're paying cash, right? So a cash is leaving, it's going down. And our rent expense and salaries expense are both increasing. So as expenses, so this is almost uh, counterintuitive, right? Expenses are increasing, we're getting more expenses. Does that mean that's a good thing? No, it doesn't. So as expenses increase, right, they, reduce equity. More expenses means smaller equity. So we'll see that here on our next little line. Right, equity is going down even though expenses are, are increasing. Okay, so here it is. So cash is reducing, again, our little brackets, right? Meaning negative, right? So we went from 57, Hundred down to four thousand with all the, with the cash leaving, and then here are our, our expenses. They are also being reduced. They're reducing overall equity down to thirty nine thousand six hundred. Transaction eight: provide services and facilities for credit. So we're providing. We're doing two things. Here, so what? Uh, so, are, is cash involved in this one? No, it's on credit, right? We didn't get paid. On credit could be both directions. We provide things on credit. We provide services and and goods on credit. We could also receive things on credit. So this means it's not for cash, meaning that cash is not involved. In this case, when we do something and we don't get paid right away we record what's called an accounts receivable. This is an asset. So accounts receivable means it has future benefit for us because we will get paid in the future and we own our accounts receivable. Uh, it's, actually, it's actually an asset that we could e actually even sell our accounts receivable to somebody else to collect. So accounts receivable is an asset. It's going up in lieu of cash, right? Consulting revenues, that's providing consulting services. So we provide dead, past terms, we earned it, we did the service. So revenues are going up there. Rental revenue, we also uh, rented uh, a facility, right? So we rented a facility and we collected rent revenue. So this is what it looks like in the accounting uh, equation. Our assets are going up 
through the accounts receivable. Right? Accounts receivable is increasing right here. Right? That's our accounts receivable. And the two revenues add up to the $1,900, right? So in that case, we are going to be able to balance, right? So sometimes on, on two sides of the, uh, a transaction, you could record one number uh, aggregating together, right? The other side of the equation. Otherwise, uh, you know, just to simplify it, any way you cut it, it has to balance. It has to balance. So, and that's what this does. We're balancing here. So, uh, transaction nine, receipt of cash from accounts receivable. So, we're receiving cash. Makes it easy. What accounts are involved here? Well, one of them is going to be cash, right? And that is an asset that's going up since we're receiving cash. The other one is accounts receivable, also an asset, right? So we got paid cash for our receivable. So we're swapping assets here. Yeah, that asset is going down, right? So we're swapping assets. And so really, it, 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 uh, so we look into the details, we can see the asset swap here on the left. Right, so this is the swapping going on here. And so uh, if you just looked at the total numbers, you wouldn't see anything happening if you didn't see the line item, right? The, the detail behind it. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to uh, transaction 10. And transaction 10 is going to be a partial payment for supplies purchases. So we owe them our vendor, uh, money for supplies we purchased back in transaction four. So we're going to go ahead and pay for some of that. We may not have all the cash for all of it, or we may, you know, want to not pay it all up at one time. So we got our cash here. We are going to pay some of our cash. So cash is going down, right? And our accounts payable is also going down. We're paying it off. So two things are going down. Uh, that's good though because they're on the opposite sides of the equal sign on the on our equation so they're reducing both sides of the equation and it looks like this right so those are the two 900s there they're going they're both reducing both sides of the equation liabilities are going down assets are going down and um, we have a balanced equation very last very last transaction here withdrawal of cash by owner so here towards uh, it goes along we do business for a while then all of a sudden the the owner says you know what I need to take some cash out of the business for whatever reason maybe they have a personal expense they want to pay for they don't necessarily pay for personal expenses within the entity right if they got a personal expense they need to withdraw money from the company and pay for their personal expense um, it's not a business expense right so this, that's what maybe what they're doing who knows so anyways cash is one of the accounts we're, we're using, right? The cash is going out of the company to the owner, to the, uh, and that means the cash is being reduced for the company on the company side, right? These are the company's books we're, we're doing here. The withdrawals are going up. It's kind of like an expense though, because as withdrawals go up, overall equity drops, okay? And so this is what it looks like in the accounting equation side. We're gonna have our cash dropping. It's hidden right here, right? So this is our cash dropping, and this is the withdrawals, more withdrawals. It means reduced equity, right? And so then the overall uh, impact is the accounting equation stays balanced because we put them in the right spots and everything looks good. This is the entire set of transactions we just went through. And I know you're gonna have something like this in your uh, exercise in your homework. And so uh, you may wanna look back through this video as you do your homework just to help you maybe remember how to do um, individual transactions. 
And feel free to contact me anytime, uh, students. If you need to ask something specific, you didn't understand something on the video, I'm open to questions. Very last, very last thing, right? So we're gonna just do some wrap up here. Um, identify and prepare basic financial statements and explains how they are related. So here are the four basic financial statements. They're in order for a purpose. Income statement is where we wrap up, we put together our revenues and expenses. Remember how they were together in the equity side of the equation? So we're gonna put those together. That's gonna give us net income or net loss, right? So that's the income statement is showing us that activity. Statement of owner's equity. Uh, as we wrap these two things up, right, they're, they, they, they make net income and that net income is going to be added to the overall equity as we do things. It's also going, there's also some other things that go into the statement of owner's equity that show change in equity. One of those is withdrawals, owner withdrawals, right? Another might be some more investment, um, those type of things. Then eventually we have a new updated equity amount, right? And that flows down here into the balance sheet. So basically the balance sheet is right here, the account, the accounting equation, assets equals liabilities plus equity. Balance sheet is the accounting equation. Okay, so it comes third in order of financial statements. Then what we have out here is we have um, the statement of cash flows. We're gonna do a little bit of that in, here in chapter one, um, but we're really gonna focus on it later on in the term. Okay, so statement of cash flows helps us understand the, our cash management side of things. Super important, right? Because if a, ca if a company runs out of cash, they're dead in the water. So we wanna understand where our cash is coming from, where it's going to, and, and our how our balance is changing. So really important statement. Uh, it's pretty complicated, so we're gonna cover it maybe towards the end of the term as we get, our, get some of this basic accounting stuff already under, uh, under our belt, and we'll be able to tackle that later. Here's an example of those of uh, the income statement, like I said, flowing in to the statement of owner's equity, and then the statement of owner's equity flowing into the balance sheet, right? So that's kind of the idea behind that. They're in order for a reason. Um, and um, then we've got our statement of cash flows there at the end. Uh, the cash from our balance sheet also flows down into, it's gonna connect with our statement of uh, cash flows as well. So that's why it happens last. We use our income statement and our, and our balance sheet and everything that we do to put into the cash statement of cash flows. So that's why it's last.